I would like to mention um, Denise's mom, uh, Malda Carter. She's had a very rough month. She's lost three uh, relatives, close relatives, just in the past month. And she's had a, a rough time with that, as anybody would. Uh, Denise and I will be going to one of the visitations, or a visitation, later uh, today. Uh, but I would, I would ask you to please remember Malda in your prayers, uh, because she's just had uh, such a difficult time with these deaths uh, the past few weeks. <clears throat> We've been given several names to visit. Several names that uh, different ones have given uh, because you are concerned about their salvation. As well you should be. And we appreciate those names. And we're going to be uh, looking at those names and, and kind of figuring out uh, who is going to go visit whom and when and so forth. This morning's lesson, I hope, will accomplish a number of things. One, I hope it will help us find it easier to teach others, to talk to others about Jesus, about the gospel. I hope it will also give us some practical ways of going about doing that. And hopefully it will also remove some hindrances to doing that. The lesson is, you know, why, why don't all Christians teach others the gospel? Or why won't some of us not teach the gospel to others? A lot of it, of course, like many things in Christianity, goes back to our, our way of thinking, our attitude. Uh, and sometimes these are things that um, maybe are valid, maybe they're not, kind of depending on the person. Uh, these are not original by, by me at all. Uh, these are things you've probably heard before. Uh, but I think they are things you might want to write down and, and maybe review on occasion to help you get over uh, not teaching others, helping others come to know Christ. So here are some of the things we need to think about. Do we ever use the excuse, I'm too busy? You don't have to raise your hand. I'm too busy. We have a very familiar account that many of you will recognize. Most of us remember Mary and Martha from reading about them, of course, uh, in the Bible. In Luke chapter 10, beginning in verse 38, <clears throat> we have that account. Luke chapter 10, beginning in verse 38 Luke writes this, Now it happened as they went that he entered a certain village and a certain woman named Martha welcomed him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary who also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. But Martha was distracted with much serving and she approached him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Therefore tell her to help me. And Jesus answered and said to her, Martha, Martha, you're worried and troubled about many things. But one thing is needed. And Mary has chosen that good part, which will not be taken away from her. Basically, if we reduce that to one thing, Martha was just too busy. Now, she had a choice of two things to do. She could, you know, go about and, and kind of entertain the guests, make sure the guests were, were taken care of, or... She could be with Jesus and listen to him teach. Those were her two options. She chose the former. Her sister Mary chose the other. She chose to be with Jesus. So Jesus says, this one thing is needed. Jesus said, of those two options, of those two things, Jesus said, being with me and listening to me and hearing me teach was more important. So Martha couldn't say, I'm too busy to sit at Jesus' feet. Jesus said that wasn't necessary. It wasn't necessary for Martha to be taking care of her guest. What Martha needed to be doing, Jesus said, was the good part that he said Mary had chosen to do, sitting at Jesus' feet and listening to Jesus. 
You know, in Matthew 6, 33, Jesus said you were to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. That's what Mary was doing in that account. She was seeking the kingdom of God and his righteousness first. Mary was not too busy to do the right thing. Mary was not too busy to listen to Jesus. You know, if we're too busy for God, if we're too busy for the church, if we're too busy to teach the gospel, then we're too busy. And therefore, it's our responsibility to get rid of something, whatever that something is. Get rid of it. That, that's what Jesus wants us to do. Just get rid of it. Because it's obviously not important. At least it's not as important as the good part. And that is listening to Jesus and doing what Jesus wants you to do. So we can't use that or have that attitude, I'm too busy. If you believe you are, then get rid of something on your to-do list. Make sure at the very top of your to-do list is what Jesus said in Matthew 6, 33. Seek the kingdom of God and His righteousness first. That needs to be at the top of your to-do list. Another one, and, and this is uh, in some ways a valid reason, but in some ways it's not. And so I want to look at that. And that is simply, I don't know enough. I don't know enough. Most of us in here probably know how one is to become a Christian, how one has his sins washed away, how one becomes a child of God or is born again. Most of us know what the Bible tells us to do. That our faith, of course, is based on the Word of God, but that faith is an active faith that leads us to repent. It leads us to make that grand confession before men, and then we are baptized for the forgiveness of our sins. Most of us know what we need to do to be saved, and most of us in here would know where in the Bible to go to find those things. And if you know that, you know enough. You know enough. Will you always know the answer to every possible question that someone could bring up? Well, of course not. No one does. But do you know enough to teach someone how to be saved? That's something that all of us must do. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15 tells us what our responsibility is. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15. It might be a verse you want to... Mark somewhere, or mark in your Bible, or put a note in your Bible about this. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15. Peter says, but sanctify, set apart, set apart as being holy, the Lord God in your hearts. And be ready always to give an answer, a defense, to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. So if we sanctify the Lord God in our hearts, if we set Him apart as being the top, then we will be ready always to give an answer, to give a defense. It comes from the word uh, apologetics here. To give an answer, to tell people why we have hope. And then he says, you do that with the following attitude, with meekness and fear. 1 Peter 3.15 isn't a suggestion. It, it's a command. It's part of our responsibility. To always be ready to give an answer. More about how we can do that in a moment. And this is a great verse in the Old Testament. You might want to mark this one down too. It's in Proverbs. Proverbs 15. Proverbs 15, verse 28. The first part of that verse. It's just tremendous. Proverbs 15, verse 28. The first part. The heart of the righteous studies... How to answer. I looked at that verse in some other translations and, and some others has ponders how to answer. See, the righteous person is going to, to do what they can to be prepared. 
So if they're going to go talk to John Doe and they know something about John Doe, they know John Doe's background, maybe religious background or whatever, and so they're going to ponder, they're going to think about what questions John Doe might want answered. And so what will they do? They will study God's Word in hope that they will be able to give an answer. So the righteous person studies, ponders how to answer, what to say. In other words, there's preparation. That's what the, the, the writer there is wanting us to know. There's preparation so that we can know what to tell people to do to be saved. And other possible questions that individual might have. No, we won't ever have every answer, period. But you know, if we were like that in school, we would never even go to school. Because one of the points is not that you don't always have every single answer to every single question. But certainly the, the idea is that you increase in your knowledge and learning. Oh, that's what we should do in the church. So as we study and ponder how to answer, over time we answer, be able to answer more questions. And we get better at it. In other words, there's a learning curve associated with it. Well, that's something we should want to happen. But we can't ever let that stop us from teaching or talking to people about Christ, about salvation, about their future. Some may say, well, I'm not a good teacher. Well, that kind of goes with the last, the last topic. Uh, maybe a better question is, how would I become a better teacher then? In other words, if I'm sitting down at the kitchen table across from, from Mary Smith, uh, you know, how would I become and what would I need to do to become a better teacher? I think that's what Jesus wants us to do is become a better teacher. So that means we need to, to ponder and think about how I can improve. What can I do? There's always going to be someone that's a better teacher than you. Well, so what? I remember when I was playing basketball. There were always people better than I was at playing basketball. That included most of the world, but there were people better than I. There's always people better at whatever it is you do. So we can't let, well, I'm not a good teacher. Well, I'm not the best teacher. Well, no, no one is the best teacher. But he wants us to become better teachers. How do I do that? This list I got from, from someone I know that the Steinshires know, and that's Dennis Tindall. Uh, he, has a, he did some work on personal evangelism that's tremendous. And here are some, some questions he put forth for us to think about in becoming a better teacher. And he has them in different categories. I'm going to go through them rather quickly, but here are some with, with spiritual qualifications, what he calls spiritual qualifications. Am I an active support, supporting member of the local congregation? Do those in my home consider me the kind of Christian I ought to be? Do my friends and neighbors know I'm a Christian? Do I speak of my salvation often? Do I invite others to come to services? Do I read from the Bible daily and meditate on it? Do I pray every day? Do I make it a rule of my life to attend every service of the church? In public, are my dress and words and general behavior bringing honor to my Lord? Am I willing to make sacrifices necessary for spiritual growth? You know, Jesus said, if you're going to come and be my disciple, you have to take up your cross and follow me daily so in becoming a better Christian, in becoming a better teacher, yeah, there are things I must do. I can never be satisfied with, with how good a job I'm doing as far as teaching others the gospel. I must always think about ways that I can become more effective. Well, those are some questions. In my relationship with people... You know, how well do I relate to other people? How well do I to, to talk with other people and be around other people? All of those things. You know, what do I, when I see someone else, school, work, 
wherever. You know, what do I see? Do I see someone that is like in a burning building and I need to go save them? Because that's kind of what I need to do. I mean, if you were going by a, 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 a car uh, that's on fire, a house that's on fire, you're not just going to walk by and say, oh, wow, that car's on fire. And just walk on by. You know, that's what the priest and Levite did, right? That's why it's not called the parable of the priest or the parable of the Levite. It's called the parable of the Good Samaritan because the Good Samaritan was the one that was good. He's the one that did the right thing. He saw someone in trouble, stopped. Well, when we look out into the world, most of the people we see are in trouble, spiritual trouble. They're in trouble with Satan. So how well do I relate to other people? Questions like, do you know about their family, their likes and dislikes? Have you visited in their home? Do you always put the interests of them ahead of your own? Do you pray for them by name? Other things that help us become better teachers. Are we sincere? Are we dependable? Are we enthusiastic? Are we uh, determined? Are we tactful? Are we courteous? Are we friendly? Do we persevere? Are we patient? Are we calm? All of those things. I think Brother Tyndall had some really good points to bring out in, in some of those lists that we can think about when we're getting ready to talk to someone or we're wanting to talk to someone. Things we can think about to help us be more effective. See, things to ponder and think about and study so that we can be more effective. We do that in every other area of our life and this is the most important area of our life. So this should take top priority. Studying how to become more effective. You know, those in the, in the teaching field, we hear that all the time. We have professional development time and we have all these things. That's, the point is of all that is to help us become better teachers. And that's important. But this is even more important. Because what we're teaching here has eternal consequences. I know another one that is probably with most, most people, and that is... I'm afraid. I'm afraid to talk to people. Well, I, I think with most people there is an element of fear involved. But of course that fear comes from Satan. That doesn't come from God. So when we think about being afraid to talk to people, fearing talking to people, we need to remember that is coming from Satan. It's not coming from God. Satan wants us to be afraid. You know, he, he, he wants to use that. So it's not unusual for us to, to have fear, but for us, <clears throat> we have to go beyond that fear. We can't let that fear keep us from doing anything. We have to go beyond it, get beyond it somehow. We can't let it stop us from doing what is right. Well, how can you reduce that fear? At least to the point where you can go ahead and, and do what you need to do. First John chapter 4 gives us some great advice. First John chapter 4 verse 18 tells us how we can do that. John says there's no fear in love. But perfect love casts out fear because fear involves torment. But he who fears has not been made perfect in love. So by increasing our love, both for God and for that individual, then that will reduce fear. Reduce fear. We have to simply face it and go ahead and do it because what we're doing is more important than the fear. You know, if I go buy a house and it would be on fire, I would have some fear about going in. And that would be natural. But if I'm going to help the person inside the house to be saved, I have to overcome that fear before I can help that person. Well, in a, in a similar way, if I know someone is lost and I'm afraid to talk to them, my, my fear of talking to them must be reduced. I, I must decrease it somehow. Well, when I think about I may be the only person that can reach them, then my love for them will 
push that fear down to where I can actually do what I need to do. The, some of the people that will be in hell, Revelation chapter 21, verse 8, remember the first group in that verse is the fearful. The first one listed in Revelation 21, 21 8 is the fear, fearful. Hopefully all of us are interested in teaching people the gospel because it is our responsibility. In James chapter 5, verse 19, the very end of that book, the last two verses remind us of our responsibility. James chapter 5, verses 19 and 20. Brethren, if anyone among you, anyone, wanders from the truth and someone turns him back, let him know that he who turns a sinner from the error of his way and save, will save a soul from death and cover a multitude of sins. See, there's our responsibility. It is everybody's responsibility. You know, my destiny is determined by how I act and what I do in this life. That's what it's based on. Decisions I've made or decisions I've chosen not to do things. So it's about what I do or don't do in this life. Well, one of the things I must decide to do is teach others in whatever way I can. There's a multitude of ways of teaching people. But we have to realize it's our responsibility. Remember Ezekiel 3 in the Watchman. If you tell that person what they need to do, then it's up to them what to decide. Their blood will not be on your hands if you declare to them what they need to know. But if you don't, then their blood is going to be on your hands. Now, that's pretty serious, isn't it? If you have some time, read Ezekiel 3 sometimes, and it's rather eye-opening. So we can't let fear or anything else keep us from doing our responsibility. Because that is our responsibility. So when we think about those those things we might say that will keep us from doing it, you know, I'm, I don't know enough or I'm too busy or that's not my responsibility, it's someone else's, I'm too afraid, whatever. When we realize how serious it is what we're doing, then none of those things will keep us from doing what's right. None of them. You know, some... Uh, maybe are afraid about uh, coming forward to be baptized, to, to confess Jesus' name. Well, we must get over that fear. Or maybe Christians who need to come before the congregation to uh, ask for prayers. Maybe there's a, a fear there that's keeping them from doing it. We need to get over and pass that fear. Whatever is keeping us from doing what's right, we need to get beyond it. We need to think beyond that fear, and remember that's coming from Satan, and get beyond that and do what we know we need to do. If we, if we know our, our classmate or our friend or our family member or, or someone we work with or whoever is lost, we need to think about them being in a burning building and what we would do if they were in a burning building. Would we simply walk on by and do nothing like the priest and Levi? Or would be like the Good Samaritan and stop and do everything we can? That's how we need to view it. That needs to be our attitude, especially when it comes to winning souls. But don't let those excuses keep you from doing what's right. David's going to lead us in an invitation song. If you need to do what's right, and it's the right time, I encourage you to come as David leads us in this song. Let us.